A sixth domain is clinical psychology, the study of mental illness. And, um, and I'll just add this, by the way, which is I, I, I teach online and I, I, I write books and so on. So I get a lot of emails from people who, um, who email me about their psychological problems. They're depressed, they're anxious, they're studying, they're suffering from hallucinations or, or some sort of uh, uh, psychosis. And I always tell them the same thing. I tell them, I can't answer your question. I'm not a therapist. I, I'm, I'm an experimental research psychologist. I don't do therapy. But I say you should seek a therapist because there's abundant evidence that therapy works. Therapy really helps and helps improve people's lives. And that's one thing worth knowing. But another thing worth knowing is actually, in some way, clinical psychology has not been a success story in psychology, in that um, therapy works, but we don't know how it works. And, it's, and, and we don't have the sort of success at treating people that we would want. Um, in my book, I quote um, Thomas Insel, and he was the director of, um, of the National Institutes of Mental Health, the United States enormously big organization for supporting research into mental illness. And when he left after serving for more than a decade, he had an interview and he said this, I spent 13 years at NIMH really pushing on the neuroscience and genetics of mental disorders. And when I look back on that, <clears throat> I realized that while I succeeded in getting lots of really cool papers published by cool scientists at fairly large costs, I think $20 billion, I don't think we moved a needle in reducing suicide, reducing hospitalization, improving recovery for the tens of millions of people who have mental illness. And his predecessor, NIMH, at the same time, came up with a statement where he said, no new drugs or therapeutic mechanisms of real significance have been developed for more than four decades. Now, I think this all sounds very grim. I tend to be a little bit more optimistic. I think there's some interesting directions. Uh, one thing which has gotten some purchase is use of meditation techniques, mindfulness meditation as part of therapy, and there's some evidence that it does well. There's these therapies that people say right now have real promise for cures, like uh, electrical stimulation of the brain, or drugs, including uh, drugs like ketamine or LSD. It might be in the future, um, for those of us who have depression or anxiety, we'll go to a therapist and be, uh, be prescribed microdoses of LSD, and that will have a positive effect. People are optimistic, but I think it's too early to tell. There is one thing of interest from that field, um, which is a different way of thinking about mental illness. So you might think of, of an illness like major depression or bipolar disorder or phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, as something similar to cancer or COVID, something you either have or you don't. You might be in different degrees of severity, but it's something discrete that, 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 that is sort of all or nothing. And a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists are rejecting this view. And they're seeing it more as points on a continuum. So consider uh, sadness. It's actually useful to be sad. If something bad happens to you, a normally functioning mind is sad. It's, it gets you mull over things and, and, and rethink your decisions and step back a bit. Sadness is only illness when it gets too bad, when you can't get out of bed, when you can't eat, you can't sleep, and so on. Or take anxiety. It's actually good to have a bit of anxiety. Um, one, uh, one clinical psychologist said, uh, people who have too much anxiety end up in psychiatrist offices. People who have too little anxiety end up in prisons or morgues. It's good to be anxious about some things. It keeps you safe. It keeps you from making erratic choices. So from this perspective, uh, the question of mental, what, where a mental illness is, what, what counts as a mental illness, what doesn't, is a matter where you draw the line. How depressed do you have to be? How uh, uh, anxious do you have to be? And drawing the line is, becomes a subtle question. It's a case where psychology blends into politics and morality and ethics. It becomes a, a social and moral decision as well as a clinical one. Finally, I end my book with a chapter reviewing everything psychologists have had to say about happiness. Um, uh, some of the things will not surprise you. So for instance, 
Uh, despite what you may have heard, money is associated with happiness. Both rich, richer countries have happier people than poorer countries. And also within a country, rich people are happier than poor people. It'd be, if you think about it, it'd be weird if that wasn't true, given that money can buy you um, better health care, better food, better lodgings, protection against various forms of predation, more freedom, more time on your own, more vacation, and so on. Um, Psychologists have also found, and this may, may well be common sense, that uh, social connectedness matters. It, it, it could well be a, a friend of mine who's a, who's a happiness researcher said, the biggest determinant of how happy you are is your social connections. Loneliness is, has a savage effect on body and soul. It's been equated for its physical effects with obesity and smoking, but it just makes us miserable. While being loved and respected, having friends, family, connections, matters enormously. Some of what psychologists have had to say may be surprising. So for instance, uh, if I asked you, what do you think the effect is of how old you are and how happy you are? You might say, well, you know, you, you're happy when you're young and then you get less and less happy as you get older. But it turns out happiness, this shows up across every country that's been studied, surprisingly shows a U-shaped curve. It means this on average, it's always on average, people sort of happiest when they're young, they get less and less happy till about their mid fifties and they're at the lowest point. And then they start coming up again. And very surprisingly, it turns out that for many people, perhaps most people, the happiest years of their life are in their sixties and seventies and eighties. Um, and the oldest years are the happiness, happiest. And, you know, if you want to say psychology has never told you something surprising, well, I think I've given you some examples, and that's one another example of something really surprising that psychologists have come up with. Um, I want to end with a story. In the prologue of my book, I begin by talking about how I took my, uh, my son to a birthday party. And I was in a bad mood that morning. So after I, I dropped him off with the kids, I slipped away from everybody, sat under a tree, and read a book I brought. And I'm going to read from, from the prologue. The book was The Origin of the Universe, written by John Barrow, a theoretical physicist. It began by describing Edwin Hubble's discovery that the universe was expanding, and then went over to evidence for the Big Bang theory of how everything started. As I read, my heart began to beat faster. It was so exciting that we could know about all this, that I could be reading about events that happened 14 million years ago. Learning about the universe, I felt insignificant, tiny in space and time. But I also felt proud of our species, that we could know so much about it incredibly long ago and incredibly far away, that we could make real progress in the most fundamental of all questions. And when the birthday party was over and I got up to get my son, the world was full of light. Driving back, I talked to Zachary about what I learned. And as we spoke, I played with the fantasy of quitting my job as a professor of psychology, getting a new degree and becoming a cosmologist. But I was where I belonged. The tombstone of the philosopher Immanuel Kant has a quote from his critique of pure reason. Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe, the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. I had spent the morning being thrilled by the starry heavens. Years later, my research would turn to morality and moral psychology, and there again, I would experience the same admiration and awe as Kant. Honestly, though, just about all of psychology gives me this buzz. It's about the most interesting topic there is, us. It's about our feelings, experiences, plans, goals, fantasies, the most intimate aspects of our being. And I end the preface with this. There's a real joy to being part of a young science. I find the study of psychology to be just as exhilarating as the study of the cosmos. And I hope you come to see it this way as well. We have made exciting progress in the field and I can't wait to talk about it. My fondest hope for this book is that the theories and discoveries reviewed here will give rise to a sort of awe in the reader, something akin to what I experienced when I read about the origins of the universe under that tree many years ago. And that's it. I'm looking forward to a, to conversation. Thank you so much, Paul, for, for that incredible presentation. And I guess let's let's delve deeper into some of the some of the um, subjects that you're talking about in that presentation. 
So two things that are difficult to differentiate from one another are the brain and the mind. So can you explain how, how they're different? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very, it's a foundational question you're asking. The brain is the mind. This, the, it's this physical thing, that's where your thoughts come from. That's where your decisions come from. When, you, when, you, when right now you're experiencing, we're experiencing talking, when, that's the brain. But we tend to study them at different levels. So in some way you could say, well, a painting just is the cannabis and the paint. But of course, the way you study cannabis and paint is at a chemical level. The way you study from a painting is, is what does it represent? What's its history? What does it mean to express? Um, a computer is a physical thing. You study it as a physical thing. You also study the program it's running. Um, if your car breaks down, you don't call a physicist to tell you what's wrong. You call an auto mechanic because the auto mechanic deals it with at a higher level. Similarly, even though the brain is the mind, there's a difference between what a, a neuroscientist would do, which is study the workings of the brain, neurons and synapses and neurochemicals and so on, versus a psychologist who, even though, of course, it all is neurons and chemicals and synapses and everything like that, would interest study at a higher level. What do you believe? What do you think? How, what sort of computations are you doing? How does one system relate to another? So think of it as a single thing but the division between psychology and neuroscience isn't studying two different things. It's studying them at different levels. I think that is a great way of thinking about it. And it's especially interesting how you mentioned that in some ways, studying the mind is like studying the, the software in a computer, while yes. neuroscientists would be like studying the, the hardware. And of course, as you mentioned too in our presentation, we the question of you know machinery, whether we are machines is becoming increasingly prevalent. Um, and especially with the implications of AI. I once, I once knew someone who said that, for example, like love is just a bunch of chemical reactions. And when you hear something like that, you think to yourself, are we, are we really just machines? And, and you say that perhaps we are, we are soft machines, but we are also more than just soft machines. So how can you expand on how the human brain is different from a computer? So I think at one level, the human brain is a computer. It, it, it is a physical thing that manipulates information that, that, um, that, um, oh, I'm sorry. Here we go. Sorry, could you do it? Is, 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 is my sound okay? Yes, you're yes. good. Um, so at one point it just is a computer. Uh, but at a practical level, your brain's very different from a MacBook Pro. Your brain is made out of flesh, which is extremely slow and works very different from electrical connections. Your brain um, is massively parallel in a way that computers are not. And this gives you an amazing capacity. If I go into my MacBook Pro and take away a piece, um, it'll just bust. It, it all, it, 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 it's working in such a way that there's a tremendous independence. The brain is relatively resilient to damage. Take away a big enough piece from the brain, you get serious damage. You damage a little bit, you're fine. Um, maybe most of all, uh, a computer is sort of a free-floating thing just depending on what you type on it and what comes out from the screen, the brain is integrated in a body with, with, with the physicality of a body, with a, a spinal cord and hormones and a gut biome and everything, making it more integrated into the physical world than a computer. That, that is very true. And it's interesting that you mentioned how the brain, if, you, if, it, if it has some damage, like some maybe some degree of damage, it can still rewire and readapt. As we see, for example, in, in stroke victims yeah. who, who rewire their, their brain to, to move again, for example. And I guess the differences become more and more blurred when we think about when we think about AI, or there was a recent art exhibit where a bunch of, I think it was just computerized creatures were writing, receiving a novel. And it makes us think about, well, what, you know, does does artificial intelligence do you do you think that perhaps it can, it, artificial intelligence will challenge our perceptions of the differences between computers and and us um absolutely uh it look this is an area where i've been wrong and i'm comfortable saying that everyone else i know in my field have been wrong too if you had asked me a couple of years ago when we'd get to the point where it would be commercially available uh, systems. They can have conversations with you, ask questions to, they could do art, 
they could tell stories they could tell they you know you could say something like you know write up um write up an economic you know write up uh, the cosmology origin of the universe in the style of Donald Trump and it could do it in a funny intelligent way. I would have said we'll have that in 50 years now we have it and everyone has been shocked by that and what it it it, it illustrates is that intelligence is not the unique province of um of biological beings that that in some way, we now live in a world where there's multiple intelligent things. There's humans. To a lesser degree, there's non-human animals. And now we have these extraordinarily intelligent systems. So in that way, it really makes us rethink things. But then we get to the question of consciousness and sentience and moral value. That's a lot harder. Um, what makes you special now we know isn't that you could carry on a conversation and do elaborate reasoning and all those things, which you know, and you can still do it much better than any and any AI in the world, but you know, but but they're catching up. But that's not what makes you special. What makes you special is you could feel pain, you could feel love, you could feel hate. Um, you would have experiences, and as such, you are a, you have moral value. You know, because you feel pain, hurting you is wrong. It is wrong to cause somebody pain. What about AIs? What about all of these computers we have and these um, robots we're soon to have? Well, there's a guy at Google who, um, who came to the conclusion that his uh, AI system is working with. This was actually a few, a few months before ChatGPT. His AI system was sentient. And if so, it was held as a slave by Google. Because if you're a sentient being, you don't work with a pay, you don't work. And, and it needed legal representation. So Google fired them, or they put them on leave for a while. Um, and um, they were not very happy with this. And people, a lot of people kind of mocked him. And I think he's wrong. I think I don't think his chat AI really is sentient. But what about when they get better and better and better? Soon are we going to find it irresistible to think of them as conscious? And if so, will we be right? And this goes back to sort of one of the great philosophical questions, which is, what's the relationship between consciousness and physicality? They don't have brains. Maybe that recludes them from being conscious. I don't know. What's kind of frightening is, you know, philosophers say, I don't even know fully know that you're conscious, and you don't fully know I'm conscious. We kind of make a guess. Uh, how conscious is a dog? What about a worm, a turtle? That's really hard. And it's just as hard when we deal with artificial beings. So I think these are really difficult problems that nobody now really knows how to solve.